All right, guys, welcome back. Today we're going to be talking about creativity. Let's hit it. All right, Abel. Creativity is one of those things that's kind of ephemeral. It's hard for people to, to know, how, am I being creative now? Am I more creative? Am I less creative? And we actually have ways of, in a lab, measuring creativity now, which is kind of cool to see what works and what doesn't. But what do you do? Like, how do you turn on creativity when you just need to have it? I need a state change. So for me, it's really easy to uh, get focused and just really hit a bunch of work. And, and when I'm in that mode, you know, mm -hmm. when I, for the majority of my day, uh, it, it's kind of hard to get out of it and then actually relax. And when you relax, that's when you really get your best ideas. Instead yeah. of just kind of like doing all these rote things and getting a bunch of stuff done, you get the higher level thinking when you actually take it down a few notches and allow yourself to open up and let things come out of you. And I, I really learned that as a musician, you know, because when you sit down, you try to write a song, it never happens. It's right. Just, it doesn't work like that. The way that it works is you have your guitar lying out there and maybe your notebook, and you're maybe a little bored or something like that, or, or you've had a hard day. And uh, so I'll walk over to my guitar, I'll pick it up, and as soon as I start playing, I can, I can almost feel my brain talking to itself. I can feel that state change happen, even if I only play for a few minutes. Uh, and once that happens, all of a sudden, it, it feels like my fingers are just playing something, and I don't know where it's coming from. Same thing happens with, with melodies that might come out, uh, and then I'll scribble those down as well. And you can, like, this sounds like it only applies to music, but this is exactly what I do with business type stuff, too. And so I might just, like, go over and hit the guitar for a little while or do something else that's, like, really creative, and then all of a sudden I have these ideas that I didn't have access to before. What do you do? I've done a lot of the neurofeedback things, mm -hmm. and, and you can do things uh, like 40 Years of Zen that just crank up your general creativity, and, and I found that that was transformative for me. I, I, was, yeah. I was already pretty good at inventing things in futurism, but that was big. But I actually made an app that was briefly out on Android, and I'll probably re-release it uh, when I get around to it. In fact, I might know my developers are working on it now. But what this app did is, is it trains your brain because you don't need neurofeedback or anything to do it. This is just like an iPhone app. But you have two modes. You have passive mode and active mode. And for years, we always believed, like neuroscientists, that you were one or the other. Mm -hmm. it was, we're not computers, but it was like a binary mode. It turns out, we just proved, I think it was at Oxford, that you can actually, like, it's a slider. Yeah. <laughs> so what that means is when you're mostly daydreaming, it's possible to have a thread of consciousness and to train yourself to have consciousness there. So when you do that, you can actually remember what's going on when you're daydreaming. Because most of the time, you fall all the way into a daydream, and blah, 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 and it's gone, right. right? All the good stuff in there was gone. Yeah. So I've actually trained myself using this kind of thing to reach in and like grab the things when they're there, mm -hmm. and just to have enough memory left to remember them. Yeah. So like, I love having an iPhone. That's my favorite thing of all or any kind of phone, it doesn't have to be an iPhone. I'm not, yeah. that, I'm not an Apple fanboy, don't get me wrong. I run Windows on my Mac. Oh no. But uh, I have parallels anyway. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so the reason I like having a phone is that I can dictate into the phone what I just remembered. Mm -hmm. So I'll be driving or I'll be at the airport in line with TSA or whatever it is I'm doing, and I'll go into passive mode, and I'm like, oh my god, that was a great business idea and I'll grab it, and I put it in my phone, and yeah. I email it to myself. Cool. It's like the old inventor's notebook, yeah. except it's a little bit more real time, and there's a permanent cloud backup of it, because I'd probably lose the notebook on an airplane somewhere anyway. Right, I'm old school, and I do it the, the old do school you? inventor way, with my notebook. I have a notebook everywhere I go, it's always in my same little bag, and if I can't have that, then I have like a tiny little notepad. So I, I still use Evernote and some mm -hmm. cloud stuff, and, yeah. and maybe notes on my phone, but I find that if I don't use the actual muscles to put it down there, What's, what's interesting is that when I'm writing it down, it seems like it's, it's cementing itself in my mind. I hardly ever have to go and look at it again. It's just mm -hmm. there from now on. But if I put it into Evernote, it's in Evernote, <laughs> but it's not there. The act of writing is, is really big, yeah. uh, no doubt about it. I'd use Notability on my, uh, my mini tablet, so oh, I can cool. write with a little stylus, which yeah. seems to cement it in there. And I think we're actually changing the nervous systems of people. Um, I did this really intensive, like personal growth kind of therapy focused thing. And you had to do like a lot of writing. And it was like getting in touch with your feelings and like, you know, the sources of where, you, why you do the things you do. And 
at the time, especially, I was like militant. Like, I don't use pens. Like, like I'm only going to type. And they told me it won't work. It won't work. So I sat down and I cranked this thing out, and it was like, like it was so good they used it as an example. And they're like, you, you, you hit it. You got in touch with what you needed to get in touch with. And I think the reason that happened is I had my own computer since I was eight. Like before DOS was invented, wow. I had my own computer. So <laughs> cool. there's something about the way I interact with words mm -hmm. that involves a keyboard. And like I can close my eyes and I can like almost type it out. Yeah. So I think maybe kids now have a different neuro brain kinesthesia yeah, yeah. kind of thing or kinesthetic thing. I don't know, you probably have studied more about the way those things happen than I have. Any thoughts on that? Yeah, I, I think that you're totally right. When you have uh, been raised in a certain way w and your developing brain has basically been doing this as it's growing and you're turning into yourself, because your brain doesn't actually develop, especially the forebrain, yeah. until you're in your 20s, um, which should be obvious to a lot of people who have ever witnessed what a teenager does with, <laughs> with his or her life. <laughs> <laughs> they make very strange decisions, don't they? <laughs> it's so strange. Myself included, for sure. Um, but when you're raised just kind of going like this, I wonder what that connection actually is. I don't think that I can relate to it quite as well because that's just not my generation. Like I, I was wow. raised right at the cusp and it's actually, it's somewhat hard to connect with people who are just a few years younger than I am because they're so used to living in this world where there's almost this barrier uh, that, that interferes with presence. Mm -hmm. So you almost have to relearn how to connect with a notebook. I feel like a notebook would be very foreign to a lot of kids these days because we were, uh, you know, raised writing, and then computers were something that we had to learn because they were supposed to be important in the workplace yeah. someday or mm -hmm. something, right? I remember taking a, a spreadsheet class and then just like, this is going to change your life ten years from now. Um, but now these days, I mean, like three-year-olds have iPads and they're they're interacting with this technology. So I think that that's actually, they are a different type of person. They have a different type yeah. of brain than we do. They, they do, and I, I'm not sure it's better either. I, right. I, my kids get 20 minutes of iPad time a week. Really? Before they're seven. Wow. Yeah, they don't get screen time. Because I want their nervous system. I want them to go outside. They play outside two or three hours a day. Because yeah. really, getting the nervous system right is far more important than playing on the iPad. Mm -hmm. And they don't seem to miss it. Like, like yeah. if there's a rubber band, like, oh, look, a rubber band. <laughs> and, and that's the same as an iPad from when you're four. Like, it's just right. like a Rubik's Cube is, I think, better than an iPad. Yeah. So I'm hoping you know, that we'll know in a while. But it, the way you write in a notepad, I wonder if, like, the kids right now who are, you know, doing this, that when they're you know, teenagers, they'll, they'll need to remember something. So they'll close their eyes without their phone, and they'll, like, move their thumbs. And that'll totally. be their creativity trigger, right? Yeah. Do you have other creativity triggers that you use? Um, I guess I will just talk about this one. Since we're in California and it's legal here. <laughs> <laughs> this is going to be a good one. <laughs> I think you can probably smell what I'm stepping in here. But no, I, uh, marijuana is something that I always avoided. I was totally like straight edge mm -hmm. growing up. Um, and being a musician, especially touring around, people were on all sorts of different things. And I remember when I, when I first tried it, I didn't really enjoy it that much. I felt like my head was... Uh, on a balloon string that was eight feet above my body, mm -hmm. uh, and I felt like I was kind of disconnected. Maybe that was the lack of quality of the stuff that I was having, <laughs> or the fact that I was drunk out of my mind, or something like that. But as I uh, as I grow older, as I uh, basically don't accept having hangovers anymore, yeah, I've been looking either. for alternatives, and this is one that I, I think. Especially for me, because I do have those modes. Sometimes I know it's a spectrum, but sometimes it feels binary. Mm -hmm. And so if I'm really hammering hard during the day on whatever it is, whether it's interviews or, or work or business ideas or meetings or something like that, having that state shift at the end of the day where I can just sit down and play music or write a blog post. Like some of my best blog posts, <laughs> you, you guys will appreciate this, <laughs> were from when I was not sober at all. Because my brain was working in a completely different way. You're, mm -hmm. You make connections. You, you use words that you weren't expecting. It's almost like uh, your, your existence is novel. What yeah. you're doing, what you're writing is novel. It's coming from a place that you don't understand, which is your subconscious. So when you have access to your subconscious mind, you can do pretty amazing stuff that you would never expect. Yeah. Well, okay. Steve Jobs, Bono. A few people out there who've done some pretty unusual things, <laughs> yeah. like like Steve Jobs talks about acid, right. uh, Bono, ayahuasca, the, the DMT containing mm -hmm. like shaman herb from South America. 
Um, I've, on very vanishingly few occasions, tried both of those things. And both of them had, they caused shifts in consciousness, mm -hmm. right? Like, I, I'm not a regular user of any kind of stuff like that. But um, I do notice that it, it for, for months after I, I've tried those things, or, or mushrooms, same sort of thing, mm -hmm. uh, that my creativity seems boosted. And just the way you look at the world, it's a little different than it was before. Yeah. And there's all sorts of questions about long term, whatever on those. But right. I, I think that it's on the, the overall, I, I think it's been really helpful for my cre creativity, but not helpful compared to the 40 years of Zen, yeah. which was the biggest boost I've had in my creativity, which, which was good in the first place. But yeah. it, it, like, Part of the whole idea of being bulletproof, being a biohacker, is being able to bring it. Like our last interview, we talked about okay, like you know, eight-hour days of being on all the time. Like I'm going to bring it some more, like we are for this video today. Yeah. The ability to bring it when it comes to creativity is a trainable thing. I'm fully convinced of that. Yeah. And when I sit down with someone and say we have to write a blog post about something, what are we going to write about? There's a switch inside your head, and, and you can learn it. And the switch is for creativity, and it's like bring it. Like I need to, I need an idea. And instead of like humming and hawing, like, right. like there's a way. Mm -hmm. And I'm working with some of my clients and working on myself, even on making that more trainable and bringing it out. Because I think creativity is one of the most important things people have because it lets you like break out of patterns that aren't even apparent. You become apparent that you're doing something. And like, what do you do about it? Well, creating the solution is kind of the big thing. Yeah. Yeah, creating the solution isn't something that you can force, but you can force that state change that yeah. allows it to happen. Yeah. And then that's the really cool part. So you occasionally partake of some interesting substances to do it. Do you ever like try the Ben Franklin trick? <laughs> Which one? So Ben Franklin, uh, when he was uh, inventing things, or was this Thomas Edison? I think it was Ben Franklin. One of those old guys. Whatever, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> he would put uh, two ball bearings in his hand and go to sleep in an armchair with a pie pan. So as soon as he fell asleep, he drop them, then they wake him up. And he was like surfing the edge of theta, like the, the, oh, when you yeah. go to sleep. So he'd wake up and then write down whatever he was thinking of. And he'd just go up and down, up, down, up, down, uh, which is one of the ways of training yourself to do this. Mm -hmm. You ever play around with something like that? Like how do you get into a theta state and bring, bring stuff back? You know, that I do that uh, next to my bed or early in the morning. Mm -hmm. Sometimes that's when my best business ideas come to me when when I've been struggling with a problem for a really long time it's almost like remembering a dream except mm -hmm. it wasn't a dream you can tell your your brain was working through something yeah. but if you don't um, if you don't log it right then it's, it's gone. really easy to forget like yeah. you you won't remember it so mm -hmm. yeah I, I make sure to write it down um, even if it's just like a couple of bullets like you'll, it doesn't have to it. you don't have to like totally wake up and mm -hmm. write a, a whole idea out but it's just like getting the the meat of it down it sounds kind of weird, but having a notepad and a pen next to your bed and looking at it before you go to sleep increases the odds, at least in, yeah. in what I've read in my own experience, that when you wake up, like it sort of tells the brain, hey, like work on something, because like there's a receptacle for it here. Yeah. It, it, it is meaningful to do that. Cool. So I think we're almost out of time. Um, All right. But one thing that, that I'd like to plug today, perhaps if people are interested in it, um, check out The Musical Brain. It was my first book. You can find it on Amazon, and it explains how you can use music to experience that state change. So the, the hack of the day, I would say, you don't have to do it with music, but find something that allows you to go from that, that bringing it and getting everything done state to that uh, super open creative state. Yeah. And in fact, I, your book rocks. It, it was one of the reasons that I invited you to the biohacking conference earlier this year, the Bulletproof one, and you totally rocked your talk there. Uh, you know, I think a lot of people don't know this about you because, you know, you're a fat burning man, <laughs> right? And, and it, it's awesome because if you want this to turn all the way, you got to get rid of the fat. Yeah. But I, I thought that was a remarkably good book, and, and we don't pay enough attention to the effects of music in the brain. So um, by all means, if, if you're thinking about reading a new book, this is the one to order. Cool. Thanks so much for joining us. We'll see you guys next time.